Happy New Year, one. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um, you're in, in for a rare opportunity to be able to hear from Bob Evans, Michael Thompson, and benefit from their experience over now, really their lifetimes. Independent school students themselves, they at one point were parents at independent schools. And classroom teachers. And classroom teachers, that's where they started in the classroom. Both have had their lives as psychologists, managers of nonprofits. But the work that I know most is their work over the last 20 years, working with independent schools, working with those schools, faculty, families, and parents, students knowing independent schools the way they do, they have been able to resonate with all of those constituencies who don't always resonate well with each other. But they do that. So what I would say tonight is um, knowing that they know us so well provides a great learning opportunity. So help me welcome. Thank you, Rachel. We have had a wonderful day. Uh, uh, Rob and I, uh, it's been a privilege and we've been looking forward to it. And uh, we were with the whole faculty um, from nine to 12. And then we uh, met with uh, three separate groups, including uh, upper school and little school division and lower school. And, and we just did problem solving. We talked about how independent schools run and the, uh, the psychological dynamics of them. And, and it was a fascinating and fun and interactive day. So we're, we're pumped. Um, with an audience this small, we are going to um, talk briefly, maybe 15 minutes apiece, if we can avoid falling in love with the sound of our own voices. That's a, a moral hazard to which we are prone. Well, one of us is prone. <laughs> Which one? I wouldn't know exactly. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, and then we want to answer the question. Something brought you out this evening, something you were curious about. Uh, and we would like uh, to make sure that everybody gets to ask a question. Yeah, because we can answer. I think we can answer pretty much everybody's question that you might have brought with you. I'm going to start off by talking about uh, 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 ch children's mental health post-pandemic. Um, Rob and I did, during the pandemic, uh, our travels, were, of course, were just wiped off our calendars, and um, we wondered how we were going to be useful to schools, and we ended up uh, visiting with the faculties, administrative teams, heads, or parents at over 200 schools literally around the world because Zoom... Um, uh, permitted that. Uh, we, 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 we went to so many schools or, or talked with so many schools. And one of the threads that was undeniable was um, a fear on the part of parents that their kids' uh, would, mental health would be destroyed by the pandemic. How many of you have read in the newspaper, heard on TV, there is a crisis in teen mental health in the United States? No. How many of you have wondered whether your own children m might be swept up as part of that epidemic of teen mental health? Thank you. Appreciate your honesty. That's what I want uh, 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 to talk to you about. I wrote a, 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 a PowerPoint presentation called, Are the Kids All Right? Um, When we were talking to parents, between the lines, we often heard the fear that children were going to be traumatized by this pandemic. That's the word that we heard explicitly or implicitly over and over and over. Um, is the, the, the fact of a school lockdown, is the threat of death and disease, is the worry about um, uh, vulnerable family members, folk, uh, 
grandparents who lived in the home and maybe had suppressed immunity, would all of this result in uh, trauma for the children? And you may be aware that trauma is a word that ha is enjoying um, uh, uh, quite a lot of celebrity now. Did you hear trauma 20 years ago? No. But now, um, why a teacher said to me, uh, uh, she was walking out of a faculty meeting, she said to me, oh, that was just a terrible faculty meeting. I'm so, so PTSD. And I thought, really, you were traumatized? No, you were annoyed and bored. <laughs> but you weren't traumatized. But it's become an all-purpose an all word. Um, so I want to, just for a moment, talk about the difference between what children experienced, which was at times hard, at times isolating, at times scary, could be grueling, um, disorienting, hard, hard. But I would argue, certainly for children in independent schools, not traumatizing. Trauma, uh, if you reserve the term for what, as a psychologist, I would like to reserve it for, is um, a completely horrifying, terrifying, overwhelming experience, which simply takes over the body and brain in an instant. I mean, if you're in the Iraq war and you're driving in an armored vehicle and you hit an IED and it blows up in your Buddy is blown to pieces. Um, or you're in Ukraine right now. And or you're in Ukraine Your whole right building now. gets destroyed or something or whatever. Right. <clears throat> or you're, you have to um, evacuate your home and go to the border and say goodbye to your father uh, who's going to go back and fight for the Ukraine. And you, you don't know if you'll ever see him again. And you're off to Poland with, uh, at your mother's side with no uh, roof over your heads. And depending on the... Uh, a charity of other people. The children in the Ukraine are being traumatized. Um, uh, there's no question about that. Um, but uh, uh, trauma is overwhelming, it's helpless making, and it, it, it leaves often somebody who's been through it in shock and denial um, uh, or forgetfulness. And then symptoms emerge because the body's been affected and, and people get flashbacks and night terrors. And there are all kinds of symptoms, um, which I'm not seeing in independent school kids. Okay, Bottom line, in resource-rich suburban public school districts or independent schools where children uh, were able uh, uh, to feel safe, and connected with caretakers. Um, so uh, traumatized children have been much, much studied. Um, social scientists have been interested in recovery and resilience for a long time. And if you get Anne Maston's book called Ordinary Magic, she's the McKnight Distinguished Professor of Psychology at University of Minnesota. And she's collected all of the data on traumatized children. And it started back in um, 1939 uh, during the Blitz in London when uh, uh, families in London were being bombed and nightly um, by the Luftwaffe. Um, uh, Dorothy Burlingame and Anna Freud began to study these kids and they wrote a book called Children of War, which is sort of the foundational book in, in, in child uh, trauma. And they were given an opportunity to have a very interesting experiment. There were children who stayed in London with their parents during the bombing, went down into the London tube or hid under the dining room table or in the cellar of their house during the bombing. And there were many children who, uh, uh, at the behest of the uh, British government, were taken away from their parents and uh, uh, sent out to farms to be safe, to be in foster, uh, or guardian uh, situations, and then they compared the mental health of the two groups of children, the ones who'd stayed with their parents 
and the ones who had been taken away from their parents. You want to guess who had the better mental health? That's right. Yep. So what Ann Maston makes, um, talks about it, it, in, in her consideration of what gives children resilience, um, what, what um, protects them against the worst aspects uh, of, of a terrifying situation like the bombing in London, it's being close, uh, closely connected to your caretakers. It's being from a family that has faith and hope, and it's being connected to your school and, and to your teachers in any rocks of stability. But it, it's those connections. And almost all of the children, the boys at my school, Belmont Hill School, where I'm the supervising psychologist, and um, other uh, uh, independent schools, almost all the children were at home. They had three meals a day, their parents, instead of being off being frontline workers or being at war, were in fact home, which was sometimes suffocating and annoying to have to spend all day, day after day with your parents. Or with but, your children. Or, <laughs> or with your children. But um, what we're not seeing in the kind of families that independent schools serve, we are not seeing traumatized children. Are there some children who were made very anxious by this? Yes, because many of them had parents who were made extremely anxious by this, and they were marinating in their parents' anxiety. And we talked to hundreds, hundreds of parents, who, one of whom, in, a woman in Los Angeles, said to me, Dr. Thompson, over in Zoom, she said, how do I protect my children from how anxious I am? And I said, that's a great question. <laughs> Get a grip. <laughs> Get, uh, but she knew that um, nobody wanted to be talking to their children about life and death every day and the possibilities that the grandparents could die and the possibilities that a, 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 a parent who'd gone through chemotherapy for cancer was now at a, a special risk or a sibling was at special risk. But what I found, and I talked to hundreds of students on Zoom, was that many of them were keenly aware that they were now an important player in their family. They had a, an important role in protecting their family by following the COVID protocols. And that they were, um, I mean, I, I remember talking to a boy at Atlanta International School, and he couldn't go to school because he had um, uh, a brother with a very rare genetic illness, which put him at particular risk. And he didn't, uh, even when the kids went back to school, he didn't go back to school because he wanted to protect his brother. And he said it was hard. He wished he could go back to school, but he wasn't gonna go back if he couldn't protect his brother. So many kids found a, a role, a meaning, a sense of mission, and all of that, all of that contributes to their mental health. Were there some kids um, who were uh, affected? There were. Rob and I went down and were at Trinity Prep in Winter Park, Florida uh, last March, the first week that they went uh, mask optional. Right. And I asked the whole upper school, I said, how's your mental health after the pandemic? Did anybody get very depressed or anxious? Actually, you can ask these questions in front of, to a high school, of 500 kids, and they'll, somebody will answer, and a girl said, yeah, I got really depressed. I got really depressed. And I said, uh, did you need treatment for it? She said, yes, but I'd been depressed before. <laughs> so I went back into therapy, and I went on antidepressant medication, and I said, and was that helpful to you? And she said, oh, yes, definitely. And I said, was therapy and the medication the most helpful thing? And she said, no. I said, what was the most helpful thing? And she said, going back to school, going back to school. So Ann Maston says, uh, in trying to summarize the research on trauma, traumatized children, and these are children who um, studied because a tsunami swept a third of their village on the island of Java or some other island in the Indonesia, swept a third of their village away, or kids, uh, in, in Palestine and, and uh, Israel uh, during uh, some of the worst conflict there. 
she finds, Anne Maston finds, that um, uh, the vast majority of children recover from trauma, real trauma, real warfare, the vast majority recover within 18 months. About that. A credit to the resilience of children. What are the factors that cause children to, uh, to um, recover from trauma? Caring, competent adults in their lives. Warmth. Structure and predictability. Developmentally appropriate high expectations. Does anybody know an institution that has caring, competent adults, warmth, structure and predictability, right? And developmentally appropriate high expectations, to me that screams school. That screams school. Actually, to me, having written a book about it, it screams summer camp. And I had so many parents in the spring uh, of 2021 because I'm connected to the camp world. They wanted me to talk about it, these anxious parents who were afraid to send their children off to camp and the, because they'd been locked in with them. They'd been, the parents and kids had been together. And I talked to a group of parents in Northern New Jersey oh. and um, uh, Dr. Thompson, how do we get our children ready for camp? Uh, are they, uh, how do we, how do we, uh, what do we do? And I said, well, you ask them if there's anything they're worried about. And then you listen to the answer. And then you put them in the car. And then you drive them to camp and you open the door and you give them a hug. And you wish them a good summer and you drive away. And it was horrifying to some of these parents because they thought post-pandemic that they should be doing something special. What I knew from camps that there were camps that operated in the summer of 2020, managed to become a bubble, and that there were both uh, sleepaway camps and day camps, and that when children who'd been out of touch with each other or the camp for even two years, there were some kids who were a little more apprehensive, there were some kids who were a little standoffish, and after two to four hours, the kids were back in it, making friends, playing, starting to sing the camp songs, and teach them, and you see, I, I had no, I had no, um, uh, a camp director has called me and say, we have an epidemic of anxious kids. We've had some kids, but almost all kids with pre-existing uh, anxious or a, a depressive episode. Is that reassuring to you? Yes. <laughs> yes. Over to you, doctor. Okay. So um, I, I want to pull back and, and take a slightly larger sort of view about the business of being a parent and share some thoughts about a, some, a couple of common dilemmas, and then we're going to stop and we're going to be interested in your questions. But help me first. Those of you whose oldest child is lower school or younger? A couple. And middle school is the oldest? Got a couple, and upper school, and beyond. That's a distribution. Two, three. <laughs> Got three people here who's older, four. All right, if we don't get to what you want and the evening's over, catch one of them on their way out because <laughs> they will have been through something that you'll want to know about. Um, so if we back up pre-COVID, let's back up. Um, it, it would be, in my view, accurate to say <clears throat> that the whole business of being a parent had been getting steadily more complex for a long time. And that the challenge about this is that um, it's easiest to be a parent when A, the rate of change around us is slow, and B, the choices for children are few. Because that's when it's easiest for adults to be confident in what I know right now, relevant to what my kids have to learn if they're going to grow up successfully. So if you imagine that the day school served a primitive Stone Age fishing village in which the men fish and the women dry fish, as I said to the teachers this morning, um, the rate of change is glacially slow, the choices for kids are non-existent, the certainty for adults is sky high. Of course, that's not how we live. 
We think how we've been raising kids here is normal. In any historical terms, it's way out on the far freakish end of human history because the rate of change is going faster and faster and faster and faster. It's harder and harder to predict the future. Even pre-COVID was harder, right? And because the choices for kids have exploded. And in fact, one of the good things about growing up these days has been that the range of choices open to boys and girls is vastly greater than it used to be, right? But the downside is it's harder to be a confident parent and to know for sure that I know what my kid has to know now. And that's a, been a real challenge. Um, <clears throat> there's actually, just as the, the, the real research into child development, the way Michael described, confirms that most kids, most kids are mostly resilient. That's true. All children have fragile moments. Some are truly fragile. Most kids are mostly resilient without fancy courses in how to be resilient. Um, but it's also true that there are a couple of basic things that are not fancy, they're actually quite simple, though they're not always easy, that have always made a difference in how kids grow up and that have been harder, not impossible, but harder for us to deliver um, uh, as the, the pace of life has quickened um, and the choices for kids have exploded. So these three things could be summarized as this. Nurture, Michael already gave you a hint about that. Uh, structure, Michael said something about that. And latitude, which is my word for the freedom to learn from experience. So um, in fact, we have a lot of evidence that kids who grow up with adequate levels of nurture, not super fabulous, just enough. Um, kids who grow up with uh, a significant enough structure to provide predictability. You heard Michael mention that. By structure, I mean a box that goes around behavior and inside the box is what we do and outside the box is what we don't do, right? And around the world, cultures have different boxes about what we do and what we don't do. It's not each particular, it's the having of a box. And by a box, I don't mean something with 800 rules in it. I mean something which is clear about the non-negotiables, right? And the latitude means that kids turn out to do best generally when they have had the chance to learn from the consequences of their experience, including the consequences of non-catastrophic disappointments, frustrations, and failures. And those three things actually turn out to make a huge difference. Um, and they are not very fancy. Uh, nurture uh, is easy to think about. Um, you think about uh, Julia Child. So she lived to just over 90, healthy as an ox, changed the way America eats, right? Um, and she knew that the basics of life included butter and wine. <laughs> <laughs> and she cooked with large quantities of both. She knew that margarine is a terrible food. It's not good for you. It tastes bad. You can't brown sauces in it, right? She used butter. That's what she called it, butter. And wine, large, you know, in the PBS still sometimes shows the last shows. She's there with little Jacques Pepin, the French chef, who himself is now in his 80s. And he's mincing up vegetables, and she's slathering the butter and pouring the wine with a loose thumb. And he's saying, do you think we really need all that, Julia? And she says, well, you don't eat this every day, you know. <laughs> she knew you needed the good stuff. You know, you needed the good stuff. And uh, she didn't usually eat seconds, but she cooked with the good stuff. And she was ready to push herself away from the table when she'd had enough. And kids, in fact, when they've had enough nurture, not super fabulous, you have teenagers, they don't want you walking around nurturing them, you know? And you don't need the same nurture at seven or 17 that you need at seven weeks or 17 weeks, but you need something all the way through that's gonna be a source of warmth, which is the Ann Mastin word that, um, that, that Michael cited. And, and kids just need enough of that. The structure, what that means is not that they need, as I said, 800 rules, they need basic clarity about what we do and what we don't do. That's easier to do in a village 
which I define as a place where everybody raises kids the same way, whether you're dirt poor in the village or not. We don't live that way anymore. We raise kids household by household. It brings us lots of individual freedom. It makes it harder sometimes to be in a village. Nobody can say, you're the only father who doesn't let his kid do that, or you're the only mother who doesn't let her daughter do that. Because in a village, everybody does it the same. We don't have that. But nonetheless, it's quite possible to say, we don't do that, we do this, you know? Um, and, uh, and, and, and it means, in my view, holding the line about the big stuff. What's the big stuff, you might ask? That's actually not for me to tell you. That depends on you and your household and your philosophy and your faith and your personality and your everything, right? Um, and my experience as a, as a father was that I didn't plan what the big stuff was, I discovered it. So I discovered, for example, that I didn't care much whether our sons had a very neat bedroom. I cared a lot about how they treated each other and how they treated other people. And I didn't plan that, I just sort of discovered it. But if you grew up in my house, that mattered. It mattered to my wife too, thank goodness. And, um, we sort of, she cared more about the neatness of the rooms, I will say, than I did. But we both, we both cared about the, how you treat other people. The, the, the latitude uh, is sometimes a little tricky because it involves something which at least I think every parent, but I certainly found challenging, which is that you have to find a way to let your children do some key learning on their own which inevitably means learning from things they do that they shouldn't. Stupid things, screw-ups, lies, cheating, things that all kids typically go through at some point in the course of their schooling and, and their lives in some way. Um, and, um, you know, if, if you, the way I think about it is this. Um, uh, th there are, <clears throat> at, at one extreme, it, you would um, leave a child free to do anything he or she wanted. So they'd have maximum freedom, but they'd have no protection from danger. So it wouldn't be good. At the other extreme, they'd never be exposed to any danger because they'd never have to live with the consequence of anything they did. So life would be a lot easier here, but there'd be no learning. And if you set those two things aside, what's left is sort of a big middle. And kids who grow up in the big middle generally do okay. And that's true about the nurture and the structure, <clears throat> not just the latitude, right? So the way uh, I think about this further is this. If I said to all of you, would you think <coughs> for a moment, please, about the most important lessons you have learned in your life so far, the deepest and the most profound, and how did you learn them? I think the odds are that just about all of us learn them <coughs> in a context of loss or disappointment or frustration or failure, and not because we win the lottery. And we might wish we could do the learning or could have done it without those losses and disappointment. That's not how life works. That's why English teachers, which I started my life out as, make your children read poems and plays and novels, because that's what they're about loss and learning. So, and what will distinguish every child in this school, including yours, is not whether some of these things happen to them, but what they do when these things happen to them. And because most kids are mostly resilient, they mostly do learning from these things. The trouble is that we never want to inflict any of this on our children, and it makes us wince, and it's hard. And because there's been so much talk, not just around COVID, but before that, about the this emphasis on trauma that Michael was talking about, many, many parents have come to imagine that kids are basically vulnerable, and if things don't work out just right, it could be awful, when the evidence is actually pretty much the opposite about that. Right? And the way I think about it is this. We, we've had too much emphasis on how we can prepare the path for the child instead of preparing the child for the path. 
And if we do too much protecting the child from any disappointments, negativity, frustration, etc., the path is smoother now, but they're not prepared for the path. So from this, for me, there emerge a couple of things that match up perfectly with what Michael summarized for you. And the first thing is that most kids these days could use a little more Mr. Rogers in their lives. Thought I was going to have to stop talking about him for a long time because nobody would even know who he was anymore. Then they made a documentary about him, and then Tom Hanks made a movie about him. So I was rescued. But you know, he liked you pretty much just the way you are. He didn't need you to beat somebody else out or be better or smarter or faster for him to be interested in you. And most kids could use a little bit more of that than they often get these days when we're so focused on how competitive they can get how early. We, we're not going to about to be giving that up. There's no way that's going away. But, you know, it could stand some modification now and then. We can talk more about that if you're interested. The structure means to me that you hold the line about the big stuff. And if you haven't been doing that and you start, um, they won't like it. And they won't like you. And what you have to do is let them get glad again. This is a phrase of my mother's. When she was being stupidly, stupidly, I mean stupidly, rigidly unyielding, and my brother and sister and I would tell her so, sometimes she would say, well, you'll have to get glad again, and she'd walk off. <laughs> yeah, yuck it up. I wasn't laughing. I thought, I, I won't get glad again. You stay here until we argue this out and you see reason. But it was sort of her way of saying, I'm sorry I haven't convinced you, but it's done. Right? It's not negotiable. Right? And you have to have some capacity to do that in order for the kids to learn some of what... A lot of what it takes to become a self-managing, self-disciplined, uh, sort of coping adult means learning that you can actually bear things you don't think you can bear as a child. It means learning that you can do what you have to do. You know, in my family growing up, Sunday after church, we had to go visit my father's mother, my grandmother. She was a, she was a difficult woman in her 40s, apparently, and she lived to 104 and died <laughs> as the purified essence of difficulty. <laughs> and she had very few redeeming qualities to me. The only one really was I was the firstborn grandchild, and she loved me best. <laughs> she had good judgment, but that was otherwise she didn't have much to recommend. Her. But it was not negotiable. That's where we went on Sunday. And it didn't matter if the wool suit they had bought me was scratchy and I had to wear pajama pants under it to keep from itching for hours. We were going to my grandmother's. So I learned I could go to my grandmother's. Right? And there's a little bit of that, that that kids actually need, and you have to be willing to let them get glad again, which is not so easy these days, especially if... Um, this happens to you. Slight digression here. It, this is going to be harder if you read too many parent advice books because most of them will emphasize the potential for trauma. Most of them will emphasize vulnerability. Others have no science in them. Michael has written a bunch that are actually worth your attention, but there are large numbers, I mean like over a thousand, that are not worth your attention. My experience about these books is that parents divide into two groups, those who read them, those who don't. This would stand to reason, right? And further, it's been my experience that the parents who do read these advice books are often upset that their husbands won't. <laughs> now, we have a few dads here, and I'd like to put in a word for the dads. If you've come here tonight, you have in your home a parent advice book that you have not read, don't. <laughs> Pick the book up and thumb through it. Estimate the time it would take you. Divide it by the number of children you have if it's three or fewer. You have four or more, get a second book. <laughs> Divide it. Spend that time with each kid doing something you and she or you and he would like to do, not because it will improve him or her or give them a leg up or make them better than other people's kids, but just because you'd like to do it. Because the, the reason for all this, which would take us a long time to talk about, but I'm actually quite serious about, includes this. The books can't account for, and often don't even try, all the things we can't change about our children. When Michael was writing 
uh, a book that he wrote about camp called Homesick and Happy. You had a chapter title that I loved, which the editor insisted on changing, and it was? Yeah, it was Eight Things You Cannot Do for Your Children. And they changed the two. Off they go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I love the idea, because in fact, I mean, all of you, if you have more than one, whether you carried them or adopted them, you, might, you know they came out different. Some are born like my first, quiet and respectful. I was there helping, I saw. Others are born like my second, not that quiet, not that respectful. I was there helping, and I saw. In adolescence, when the hormones kick in, the quiet ones often get noisier, but the noisy ones never get quiet. <laughs> it's what we call temperament and personality, and it doesn't change. It doesn't change. And a lot of being a parent involves setting these limits I'm talking about, but also coming to grips with the fact that there are things that just came in them and aren't coming out of them. And that most of those things, though they may have a, a weak point, are likely to have a strength as well. The last thing, the, the, the latitude for me is, um, what it says is actually, the, not that you need to do more, but that you need to do less. And by that, what I mean is two things. Um, if you'd like your child to grow up to become a confident, resilient problem solver, they will need practice solving problems. And ways you can help this include this. One is not to routinely do for them something they can do for themselves. Now, I don't mean don't fix them any cereal in the morning before they go to school if they can actually pour the... But basically, kids who grow up here in this country compared to kids most places in the world, basically don't have to do squat. There's a nice piece of research that shows that growing up having to do chores has very positive impacts uh, when kids reach adulthood. But routinely doing, routinely for them, things they can do for themselves is not a way to build confident problem solvers. It is a way to build people who feel like they're being raised like a house guest. <laughs> the second thing is this. It's not to leap to solve problems, especially small ones, that they bring to you before they have a chance themselves. So your child says to you something like this. The coach is being unfair, playing kids ahead of me who aren't as good as I am. If you want, you can do what more and more dads do these days. Get on the phone, take the kid literally, get on the phone, call the coach. Or if you'd like to help the child become a more resilient problem solver, you can say, gee, that sounds tough. Tell me about that. You listen a little, and then you say, what do you think you're going to do? What do you think you're going to do? I don't care if the kid's eight. What do you think you're going to do? The child has no idea or a bad idea. Help them out. You don't have to withhold. You don't have to let them go do something stupid. But if you race to fix it, you think you're going to be helping them. Actually, you're not helping them develop the actual trait that you want them to develop. It's paradoxical here. And so what really often is very helpful is to give them even some minimal chance to think about how they'd cope. And then you can always step in if you need to. But stepping in first, though it seems in some ways kinder, and it's a, our natural impulse often, if you can restrain it, is a way to help them do a real piece of growing that can actually be quite helpful to them as, as, as they grow up. There's lots more things that we could both recommend. But to me, this kind of quick summary we're each giving you um, points in the direction of saying that most of what kids need is not fancy, it's not highfalutin, you don't have to be a child development expert, you don't have to read a ton of books. What you need to be able to do is be clear about some of these basics. And that um, if you're able to do that, your kids have a really good chance. And if you send them to a really good school on top of that, their chance is even better. Thank you Thanks. for having us.